meeting is being recorded. Yes, so hello everyone. Good evening. I hope I am audible. Yeah, please confirm in the chat box or you can speak. Uh, yes, Am I ready? Okay, okay. So let's begin this session. Uh, I welcome you all in the day three of the Atal FDP hosted at RK University, Rajkot, Gujarat. And this is the under banner of the cybersecurity and digital forensics. And today we are having the distinguished personality, Vanna Verma, ma'am. She is working at the uh, SNEEK as a security relation le uh, leaders. I welcome you, ma'am, at the Atal FDP. I hope I am audible, ma'am. And let me make you the host also. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, you are yes. audible, to me, sir. Yes, ma'am. So first of all, I'll introduce you, and I'll I'll make you host, and then we'll start, ma'am. Sure, sir. Yeah, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so let me introduce Vanna, ma'am. Vanna, ma'am, is a security leader at SNEEK, podcast host, diversity and inclusion advocate, and an international speaker and influencer on a range of themes in information security including application security, DevSecOps, cloud security, and security careers. From being the chair of the OS, global board of directors, to running various groups, promoting security to organizing conferences, to even delivering keynote addresses at several of them. She is engaged continuously and proactively in making the global application security community a better place for individual organizations and societies. Today, Vanna Ma'am is going to deliver the session on the application security lead with grit. Yeah, so uh, we are very uh, glad Ma'am that you are uh, with us for the Atal FDP. We are from the RK University Rajkot and from the entire Gujarat faculty members are joined with the uh, PhD scholars and MTech students, and they are working with the cybersecurity and digital forensics. So over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the introduction. I'm really honored to be speaking with, uh, with the leaders, with veterans, and uh, people who know academics a lot more than me. So if I make any mistake, apologies in advance. And uh, I would try to share what I know. And uh, from my experiences, uh, I would be sharing a little bit about application security. But we would be starting off with different domains of cybersecurity because cybersecurity is very, very vast. And we would be covering API. We would be covering cloud native application security and how these attacks work in the environment these days. So I would try to cover more from an industry perspective and uh, I would be open for feedback in the end. I am uh, taking questions. Uh, you can post it in the chat, but we'll have a half an hour question answer session in the end. And uh, I am nervous. I am excited. Nervous because I am speaking with the, the students and especially PhD scholars and professors and all the people around. Uh, and excited because I got an opportunity to speak here. So thank you so much, sir, for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, yeah you are always welcome, ma'am. And we are really excited to hear you because we are following in YouTube also. And uh, this is our uh, uh, pleasure to meet you on this uh, online sessions. So please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. So I think you are in the USA right now. Yes, and it's 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, please, ma'am. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm just going to turn off the camera just to avoid any bandwidth glitches because uh, generally it happens if I'm on video, this happens. So I'll just stop my video. Um, yeah, sure. Let me, let me just share my screen as well.
So please let me know when you are able to see my screen. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am, your screen is visible, ma'am. Thank you, sir. So I have actually broken down um, the session into these parts, which I want to be sharing, which I want to share with all of you, uh, like starting with basics of cybersecurity. What are AppSec specialist, application security specialist, like even the basics of it. Um, some of you would know it. Some of you would not know it. Uh, and if you have any question at any given point of time, you can keep posting in the chat box and we can take up later on. A lot of times what happens is that um, we don't tend to ask questions. Now here, I'm not sitting in front of you. So you can be very open in asking questions. If you are not comfortable in asking in public, you can just DM me the message and I will open it after stop sharing so that it's easy for me to take up questions and then responding it to you. And um, what I believe in that if we don't ask questions, we would never get the answers. And I want this session to be useful to you. Even if it's 10% um, learning that I can cascade it from my end to you, I'll be very happy and honored to do that. Um, so I would share OWASP top 10. I would share OWASP, what it talks about in different platforms, as well as different terms that are used in the industry. And APIs, microservices are becoming very big. So what are the top issues in APIs? And what is cloud native application security when we are moving from in-house four, uh, four walls application security to the cloud uh, like AWS, Azure, um, GCP, or any other cloud that we have. So I would open my first presentation. Uh, why I did that, generally I don't make like so, so many presentations, but this session was uh, purely to make sure that we have people who understand the application security from the basics and we have two hours, which is a good time for us to discuss. And here I want to ch uh, change your mindset for positive about cybersecurity because this is something which is very important. And about me, uh, a little bit about me, I'm working with Sneak. Sneak is a software security company. I didn't know it like five years back, but um, uh, I recently got to know like, Two years back about it, that there's a company named Sneak when they reached out to me and I realized it's a big software security company. And uh, I joined in as uh, taking care of their India, um, India and Asia Pacific security for them. And um, apart from that, I love working with open source uh, communities, open source components, and I work with application security communities. OWASP is one of the biggest communities in application security. So I'm on their global board. I'm their first Indian, Asian, and women chair. And uh, it's been two years. This is my third year um, serving on the board. And next year would be my fourth year and the last year because you can only serve for two terms in 10 years. Uh, apart from that, I run certain diversity initiatives in India. Try and do that uh, to help the community. And it's not just for girls. It's not for kids only, but it's for anyone who want to know about cybersecurity because the way scams are happening, they are becoming a big thing. And that's why I would be covering these basics. Just yesterday, a friend of mine lost 20,000 rupees. I, I, it might not be a big amount. It might not be a small amount, but it, it is a big thing for some people. So he reached out to me saying that these things have happened and um, what should I do? So I would be talking about that as well, that if something happens to you, what you can do. And especially uh, if I have to call it out, it just does not happen to non-tech people. It can happen with anyone. It can happen with the tech people as well. Like think of this person who is into cybersecurity and this has happened to this person. By mis like, so we would, I'll be actually sharing, I'll leave this for uh, uh, almost end of this presentation, but I'll be covering soon about that because that's very important incident that I thought I'll be sharing it with you. Now about our introduction to cybersecurity, what is cybersecurity? Let's put it in a very simple thing. Anything around us on the internet, we need security around it. Because once you are on the internet, you are your data is already available over for anyone. If people say, oh, I am 100% secure. Trust me, no one is 100% secure ever. There are um, 
so many vulnerabilities there are so many bugs there are so many security issues in the code to application to the uh, websites that keep coming up that we can't avoid it from twitter instagram to facebook to any website that you pick up every uh, application some way or other the, uh, have been part of those breaches even recently there was an instagram issue that that actually shook a lot of people businesses which were running over instagram they were facing issues their account were taken over by attackers so that was very strange so what is app cyber security in very very basics is the practice of defending computers and servers or mobile devices or anything around us that's connected to the internet in simple terms now why do people hack mm, they have a motivation why do i hack because I am getting, I'm getting paid by my company uh, to actually hack their applications, telling them there are security bugs before anyone can find them. And that's why pay, they're paying me. Now, there are people who want to take revenge. Now, another interesting aspect is that because they want to do it, they want to be famous. Uh, so there was an Uber hack a few weeks back. It was one big hack in the history of cybersecurity. One of the biggest hacks. Not the biggest, but one of the biggest. Why I'm saying that? Because when this guy got access to the servers by simple multi-factor authentication, like multi-factor authentication, we can think it's sa is safe. But then this guy did so many push requests that the person who was part of Uber just gave in and said, okay, I accept, I'll give you access. Now, this guy got the access, um, did the privilege escalation now what is privilege escalation you are logging in as a phd scholar and now you're upgrading your access to be a professor to be a dean or, or to be an hod and you have access and you can see a lot of other resources as well so this guy did the same and even with uber there was a, a vulnerability research program where people submit issues and they get paid now this guy got the access to those report as well so he got into other flaws as well and did so many nasty things even on the slack and everything internally it was maybe for fun because the name is still not out or even to uh, take out the intellectual property of the organization it can be done in any way people have different motives to hack uh, cia tried it has been there for ages since we talk about information security. But it's not just the only thing that's left now. People have added multiple A's to it. People have added multiple things to it. Now to start off what CIA tried is, it's availability. For example, right now we have Facebook and or Instagram. Like people are a lot more active on Instagram now. Uh, so, you're there on Instagram, you're a social media celebrity. So there are so many followers that you have and you want a picture, you want to post a picture of yourself, your food or anywhere that you're traveling. So once you post the pictures, the site goes down. And now people can't like, share or comment on that. And you're like, what's happening? I want to be available all the time on the social media. So that's availability, where you want the servers to be available all the time. It should not be like, oh, there's an attacker who got the access to the system and brought it down. Nobody wants that. Now, what is integrity is, let's say I said something to Snehal, sir. And whatever I said, that's reaching in the same words, same format, no change, not even a single alphabet change. The information is traveling like as it is. It, it should not be like a Chinese whisper, whisper. I said something, something else got reached, then something else happened. No, it has to be exactly the same. And that's where integrity, there's no change in the information. And that's what we really want. Now, confidentiality is where if a person is supposed to access few things, they will be able to access only those things, not anything else. Like I uh, I was mentioning that you are a PhD scholar, you are an MTech student or MCA or other master student, and you are supposed to only access your assignments. You should not be able to access the, the professor's uh, page where all the people are or all the students are uploading their assignments that you don't want. Oh, you do want, but not the professor they want, right? So confidential, confidentiality is the person who's supposed to have access only have access to certain things, not everything. Now, this is an interesting picture. I'm a person who's less of a words. Sometimes in the presentation you would find, but 
I want more of pictures so that you can remember things. And that's why I remember things. And um, uh, cybersecurity is one area where you want to be more related. Oh, okay. If this can happen to them, that can happen to me as well. So I want you to remember in that way or what can go wrong. Similarly, let's say you trust a, a friend and uh, you share certain information with them and they say, oh, I'm going to keep it secret. And then they pass it on, which happens all the time, whether we accept it or not. Even our best friends do share our secrets further, if not with anyone else, but with their spouses, with their with their peers, with their partners, they do share that. So interesting aspect to that is that if we can't keep our own secret, how can somebody else keep our secret? And that's what the cybersecurity is all about. When you can't keep your pin with you, your password with you, how can somebody else would be able to do it? Okay, now I'm going to ask a simple question and I want really answers in the chat box. It, I, I don't want it to be like I'm speaking and you're listening. No, I don't want this session to be that. So what I really want is that um, you tell me, okay, you tell me how many of you use a uh, toothbrush. And do you share it with anyone? Let's put it this way. Do you share it with anyone? And I'm not going to move further till the time I start seeing answers. I really want to see answers from people that are they really listening to this conversation? Because um, I want this to be useful. Okay. You, so people use pass, people use a toothbrush, but they don't share. Why don't, why don't we share our uh, toothbrushes? There's a simple reason. It's a personal hygiene. So our passwords are like toothbrushes. When we don't share our toothbrush, why do, I, why, why do we even share our passwords with anyone? I don't share even pa my passwords with my husband or with my partner or with my kid. Sometimes my kid do actually um, shoulder surf or uh, just peep into my password. That has happened multiple times and I have to change my passcode. But that can happen with anyone. So remember this as like when you can't share your toothbrush, do not share your password with anyone literally anyone and even i was saying the same statement at one of the uh, one of the conferences and somebody said why do you consider it consider it as your toothbrush consider it as your garments you never share them with anyone so these are that secure i know that sounds absurd sometimes but the person who's call it out loud was very much confident and uh, has a point so passwords are very much to you only Let's start there. And your security starts there because you can't blame anyone else if something happens. Um, now, this picture um, summarizes something that I did at my house once, wherein you have a toaster and uh, a toaster has been hacked by somebody. Instead of toast, it's just blended. Like it makes something like a mix of it rather than just a, a, a toaster. Now, what I did a few years back, my brother got a Bluetooth chandelier. It's called Joomer. So he was very fascinated and the whole family was very fascinated. The interesting bit was that um, they were playing a lot of uh, music with Bluetooth. And I searched on the internet that is there any Bluetooth hack that's available for such Bluetooth connected devices? And the moment I did a search, within 10 minutes, I had a script. So when um, my family was out, out and around, I thought, let me try and run this on the um, chandelier and see what happens. Now, anyone could connect to the chandelier. That's the fun fact. So I connected. I ran that script and it started spinning and could not stop. I was laughing. It could be scary, right? But um, the very same night, we were all on a dinner table. Um, we were having dinner. and suddenly. I ran that script and it started spinning. That The Joomer started spinning and started sing, uh, singing loud music. And everybody was scared. Like, is there a ghost? Like, do you see any ghost there? Then I had to tell them that this is the thing. This is the most simple thing, but this can be scary and funny at the same time. Um, I'll give you another example. Now here, 
you share you keep some data somewhere and give the key to somebody else and uh, anybody can come and take it out and then you keep searching what the data was how the data was or think of a situation you've kept a, um, you kept it somewhere and you forgot the password how do you retrieve it that's also part of cyber security so you'll have to have an understanding how you can retrieve it now what that brings us to is that there are certain threats in the industry there are certain vulnerabilities what are threats threats could be anything that can harm you but vulnerabilities are there in the system like issues um uh, apple to android to any ecosystem that you talk about they keep posting new issues they keep posting updates now a simple question would be do you update your phone do you update your operating system ever just say yes or no that's it yes ma'am now we update our phone because there is a simple reason to it because we want our systems to be up to date we don't want any attacks to happen we want sometimes we just want the software to be updated because it keep popping us right but well, the important aspect is that there are certain attacks that are happening on our systems and people have found that okay this thing can actually avoid that attack so they put it as a patch they put it as an update so these are the terms that are used there like patching something you have an issue and you are pasting it plastering it or you are updating it to some new version so that you don't have that issue in your phone or your operating system now while we do that there are still people who have different strategies and methods to avoid that like if you tell me don't do this trust me i'm a person who will always want to do it or you have to tell me why i shouldn't do it it's like a kid's psychology if you tell kids not to do it they will do it for sure they want or you have to give them an explanation why they should not do it and it's very very human and that's fine but those strategies can be very tricky for example um these are some very common techniques like keylogger phishing bait and switch don't you don't have to take a screenshot of this or you don't have to just um think of like so many terms at one page because i'm going to explain each of them now to start off what are keyloggers keyloggers could be software or hardware earlier it used to be a lot more hardware because we were using desktops and uh, now they are more of softwares what are those so if you have a keylogger installed on your system by mistake or somebody has sent you that software and you have installed on your system by mistake uh, via an attachment what this could do is any stroke that you make on your keyboard that will be logged and sent to the person and that's actually true why i'm saying that so i was getting trained uh, for my ch exam way back in 2007 seven ish around and ch like certified ethical hacker was like a very big thing we didn't have too many classes and we didn't have too much things going on with that and we were we didn't have that big community or linkedin was not that active let me put it this way um, and, and nobody was very much vocal about it on that or maybe i was not so um i went for one of the local trainings and my trainer said that i want you to type your username and password and log in and see uh, the email that i've sent i said i'll check later so do you would you have access to it and the fun fact i didn't have my personal laptop till then like really i didn't have it so i was like no i'll figure out i'll i'll take it somewhere like why would you check it on someone's laptop you can check it here so i typed in my username i typed in my password and logged in and then the person said did you check the email i said yes it was a normal email hi this is so and so that's it and i logged off and then the person says is this your username and password is like you can know my username because you're sitting next to me but how do you know my password the person had a keylogger installed and the person said see this is what a keylogger can do interestingly a lot of people don't even get to know that they have keyloggers installed and their keystrokes are getting information from their system to somewhere else 
how scary that would be you have a gmail you have your instagram you have your facebook you have your other accounts like i'm super active on twitter can you take my twitter password i'll be the most scared person so i wouldn't want that to go now that's about key loggers but then what is phishing uh i think there's someone who's on unmute can you please mute yourself okay one second let me mute you who is that person okay rupesh i'm muting please mute yourself okay ma'am go ahead please i'll check sure sir thank you so yeah. phishing is a very simple term but it's one of the biggest issue of all times with any industry because with phishing you can, people can trick you to give the information in organizations what happens is that uh, attackers target the organizations it, it phishing can be of any type so if i have to tell you about targeting phishing targeted phishing where they change just one letter like my company's name is sneak and before that i was working for ibm now what they do is you type ibm to imb to ibbm or ibmm all of those things or ibm dot in or ibm dot com they just keep changing those things similarly with sneak they change from snyk to synk sync a lot of people actually call it as sync now i wouldn't even realize that this pe- this email has been um sent by someone who's a fa- who's a p- fake person and i give my details could be about the project that i'm working on or a lot of time you get phishing calls like a phone calls like proper scam calls to give the cvv number otp details which you should never do that that's so common or you go to a website and 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 you don't realize it's not the actual site it's the it's a replica of some site and you put in your credit card details and once you put in your credit card details you're gone you must be thinking it might ask for otp trust me it will not ask if it's an international transaction i do a lot of international transactions and it does not ask me for an otp just my card details with my cvv number and and i'm done so phishing can be very very tricky you have to be very very careful about it where the mail is coming from where you are going to which link are you clicking so sometimes you'll have to be a little more cautious another thing is that when you go to such websites which have ads there are people who have malicious ads on those websites and as soon as you click on those web uh, ads there could be malware that might be downloaded on your system you wouldn't even get to know it'll just work in the background that has happened with me so i bought my laptop and uh, i was very fascinated by these uh, uh, browsers and what not and i wanted to check everything so i was working on this browser and there was a suddenly a link popped up i clicked on it and i didn't realize there was a small malware that got installed with that that was called adware trust me that was one of the most annoying thing i've ever dealt with that made me more even interested in cyber security why because every time i open the browser or sometimes i even don't open the browser and it says do you want to lose weight do you want to travel to this place anything i say that oh i have to look for a new apartment do you want to look for an apartment in this area it was so scary and sketchy it took me 3 days to remove it from the uh, from the dll files to what not i did and by that time google was not super fa- famous or was not there not there actually if you have if i have to put it people were not that on the internet and everything used to be a little more slower than what it is now so um interesting thing is that we have to be very cautious of such things now apart from that session hijacking that's not very common these days it is not one such common thing which you would see because most of the websites are um, very much confident that their sessions are being maintained but um, if let's say i have to say you ha- you log into a website there's a session id that gets generated there's someone who sends you a link when you click on that link all your browser sessions because they store get stored in your browser sent to somebody and you like why will that happen now when you log into your facebook your gmail 
do you log in every day? No. Once you log in, it saves your username and password and, and you're done with that, which means you don't have to type your username and password every time. So what happens is that when you use your username and password, it gets authenticated from the server, which is like Facebook, Gmail, Twitter, or any server, and it's generate a session. So session ID has been given to you for a certain period, could be five days, could be seven days, could be 10 days, or could be indefinite. Think of same situation with, with bank. If you leave your session for five minutes, not even five minutes, even that early, your session would be timed out because there's a session timeout thing that's there. But if you are not on a secure channel, if you don't have a lock sign on top of your browser, can somebody get your details? Can somebody get your session details? Absolutely, any given day. I have done it. Now, session hijacking is really the big thing. So remember, when you are interacting with any website, that should be secure. It should be on HTTPS, not on HTTP. HTTPS has to be the thing. Hypertext Transport Protocol Secure. Another thing is that a click jacking. With click jacking, what happens is that when you go to a website, there are people who fool you to click certain things and hijack your cl clicks. So anytime you try and go click somewhere else after getting hijacked, you would be clicking certain malicious things. You wouldn't even get to know. Or uh, evas dropping. So what is that? It's like I tell something to Sneel, sir, and you're listening in the middle. Or I tell something to my best friend and somebody else is listening. And how can that would be possible if we don't have a private conversation, if we don't have an SSL connection, which is secure uh, socket layer, like I was talking about HTTPS, if we don't have it, and if your website is on HTTP, anyone can look at that conversation and hear it. So secure communication is very, very important. Even people, what they do is they create fake Wi-Fi on airports. Trust me, that's so common. And once you connect to that Wi-Fi, people can actually look up that information, can spy you, can see what you are checking out if it's not a secure communication. So what I do, even if I connect to those public Wi-Fi's, I put a VPN so people cannot check out what's happening around. Or I try not to connect to any public Wi-Fi. Funny thing, I'm in the uh, hotel, so I have to connect to hotel Wi-Fi and I'm still not sure if it's secure or not anyone and it's full of all the application security people who might be just waiting like this lion to put an attack to get the details wherein what happens is that there are people who stay in your system who stay in the browsers and attack at the right time when the time is right when they feel okay this is let's do it and even the malwares are of different types spyware there's a simple software on your system spy on anything that you do adware's Trust me, they are the craziest one. So many ads, so many things. Like, do I really want to lose weight? Do I really want to travel? Do I really want to see this? All those ads keep popping up. Uh, Trojans, viruses, worms. The most interesting one is ransomware. It has been very, very crazy. It is not new. When I was a kid, or even I was not a bo I was not born, ransomware was there. Now I'm grown up. I have kids. Ransomware is there. Now, our kids are going to grow up. I think they're going to be there. Why? Once you install this malware, this type of malware, it encrypts all your files. It zip all your files and ask for the money. And till the time you don't pay the money, trust me, it is not going to be easy. Last year, what happened with one of the biggest uh, pipelines of US, that's called Colonial Pipeline, there's an attacker this attacker got the access to certain credentials from the dark web or whatever we call it as picked it up from somewhere. Let's put it this way. The person picked up the passwords, tried for certain accesses for this person, did a social engineering because, okay, the accesses are there. Now, when this person did a social engineering, figured out this person worked for this pipeline. Let's try and do some attack. Use the password and the password worked. Got into the system even though the password was for VPN, interestingly, got into the VPN, 
encrypting fi encrypted file and ask for five bitcoins. That's a really huge amount. FBI got involved. The amount was paid. The recovery key was came in, but the recovery was so slow that the organization had to do it from backup. So that was very, very tricky with Colonial Pipeline. So we have, we have to be very, very cautious. So there are certain worms, there are certain viruses which replicate, there are certain which does not, you have to click on them, or there are some which just spread it everywhere. That's why we don't recommend sharing pen drives anywhere. I don't use anyone's pen drive ever. Now, I'm going to take a pause and let you see this screen. So Logic Bong is one interesting one. Now, what is Logic Bomb? The bomb actually, if this this is this kind of a um, malicious code has been put in somewhere, and there's a timer that this time this malicious malicious code should run, it is bombarded a lot of things. I'll tell you a funny story with one of the Indian banks. So there was a, a developer, and what this person did that with every transaction, one pesa would be coming to my account. One pesa is not a big amount, but how many transactions do happen in a day? Tons and tons of it. So even if one person did one transaction and hundreds of people did hundreds of transactions, what happens next? So many amount, so much amount going to one account. And if this person would have stopped this code, maybe in a day or two, would have been a richer person, but this guy did not do it. And actually the person got caught. Similarly, this can happen with anything. Could be malware, could be bringing down the website itself. So the way you want it. There are backdoors who might be installed on your system and you don't even know about it. So don't click on anything till the time you know it. There's an unknown software, delete it. Have antivirus systems. So uh, the technology that can scan your systems. Now I'll come to the basic of it. I have not even started application security yet, but these are some basic things that I have to tell you because this is my favorite and this is full of text. Now, who can access what I put on the internet? Sometimes I have privacy enabled so people can't access it, but I have to tell you a story of mine. Uh, I went to US for the first time way back seven years back, six, seven years back. I was the happiest person. I was like, oh, I'll click these pictures, these things. That, even though I still do some, do click some pictures and people know that where I am because I, I post about it that I want to connect in this place. So when I landed here yesterday uh, morning, so I was like, I want to meet some people. So I, I tweeted about it and people said, okay, I'm here. Let's go out for dinner. Let's meet. Let's have some chat. So I'm meeting some people here. Now, similarly, I did post some pictures that back then. And I was so excited. But after a few days, I realized, what am I doing? Why am I posting so many pictures there? So I deleted those pictures. And uh, interestingly, when those pictures were deleted five, six years back, my friend came back to me during COVID times because we were all at home doing things, more things than any, any time we would have done. So these people found out some of my pictures and sent it to me saying, Oh, these pictures are good. When we never saw their pictures. I said, they're not on the internet. But they told me that they are on the internet. And I realized they were on the archives. So remember one thing. When you post anything on the internet, it stays there forever. And I have to tell you our live case, which happens with a cybersecurity person. This person tracked down his friend and said that I wanted to know about this person long back in school, could not trace back. Now I could trace back her father's information, her father's PAN card to Aadhaar number, to office information, to her college information, which college she was studying medical, to everything. And this person made a nice blog post about it. What is this called? Stalking. Literally stalking. And he was taking that I'm helping people, but realized everyone in the cybersecurity industry, not just in India, everywhere, fired at this person. This person deleted the blog 
the very next day not the same day but the very next day by that time it was there on the archives and everybody was floating around the person was part of ovasp and ovasp also had to ask him to step down as a chapter leader of one of the indian uh, chapters indian cities and that became a big thing and don't you think that this person organization got to know about it they got to know and they fired him just one block took out a lot of things now that didn't stop there another interesting aspect to that was people should think before posting such issues such things so anything that you post on the internet stays there even a friend of our big community posted something around political and that backfired on this person you can just check on the internet these things have backfired on a lot of people um i posted a small post about supporting my friends at some place and other people started blasting at me i had to remove that tweet but do you think that tweet was removed i was not saying any bad thing but i realized think before 100 times before you post anything trust me social media is cool i am there on instagram to twitter to everywhere but anything that i post i always more be more mindful of what i'm posting um also sometimes your privacy settings do help when you are taking care of your accounts so always check out those things now let me do this okay so use of social media monitor it do it very carefully don't give out your birth dates don't give out your addresses don't give, give out your family member details your education tell that i'm it's necessary like your uh, linkedin or so but then let's be very cautious about it protect your yourself and your people your family from all of these things i have been in conversation with one of the ips officers in kerala i have this session recorded with him on my social um, on my youtube as well wherein this person this ips officer said that they are seeing so many issues with these social media sites there's a person who may who became friends with someone on the social media and this person said let's meet up at some place this person was murdered or for extortion because this person turned out to not to be a friend but to be a competitor of his father and there has been so many cases so you have to be very very cautious with whom you are chatting on the social media and then there are people who actually pull out your information just by calling oh i'll have to give you an example so i posted something on olx olx is super famous and um then quicker and all of these things are super famous everywhere and this is not to pick on olx or quicker this is just a common technique which people are playing with such websites and uh, even though these websites are trying to do make to make sure that we are we are not impacted by that but still i posted an ad and just right after that oh um can i send somebody to to your home to pick that up and i'll pay your pay you money by a paytm i said why hmm. i don't want that so the same thing happened with a friend uh and he got a call from someone saying oh i am from navy and um i want this product uh, we keep, we move very frequently can you do that and i'll pay you by online this person said okay they they sent a link of the same amount clicked on it typed their uh, upi id upi ott and boom the money instead of getting credited was debited so be very very cautious of such in social engineering calls now so cyber security and artificial has been uh, uh, artificial intelligence has been a thing these days saying was with cyber ethics we need to have ethics for ourselves and what we do on the internet or we would be in very much trouble intellectual property or copyright things have to be very very clear if i take anything from the internet i say oh i have picked it up from the internet there are times which i like content and i keep it but i attribute it to the people or it will be plagiarism or it will be copyright breach that might happen and i might be doing unintentionally as well so be very very cautious about that if i write something i be very very cautious i check 10 times before doing anything sometimes what people have done it has that they picked up content from the internet and reworded it 
and that's fine but then it has been picked up by plagiarism tools so when you reword you have to be in such a word that you may have the same meaning but turn and twist the words it is totally fine to use the content or use the content and attribute people please do that or it will be a big thing now what do you see in the image that we all are together in this in different color different sizes different age groups different uh, uh geographies and everywhere we are all in this together there are multiple cyber security fields so cyber security has an open arms for anyone literally anyone in the industry um uh, could be infra if you like working towards the infrastructure you have app infrastructure security then you, if you work if you want to work around applications like uh, writing code um building applications you can have application security networks like i love working for routers i uh, uh, 6 years back what i did i opened the router at my home because it was giving trouble and i could fetch the details from that like but i wanted to secure it so network security cloud is something which is someone else server we are using so cloud security thing is very very big there to stay mobile security we have all mobiles um it took me good time to understand mobile device security to uh, the code that we use and mobile app testing anything and everything will have mobile app security now what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop here i generally keep few things about different organizations like um ibm sneak now i'm going to stop here and i'm going to ask you if you have any questions before i move to my next presentation hello yeah hi uh good evening ma'am good evening okay uh if i am using uh, antivirus mm -hmm. and uh, from that i am using safe browsing mode mm -hmm. and uh, then now if i am using any of the website and i am just logging on to any of the website then still there are any chances of uh, session hijacking yes absolutely antivirus does not guarantee you that you are secure antivirus is something which match certain signatures certain checks on your system if you have that software which could be malicious so there could be new malware that might be downloaded on your system and you, your antivirus might not be getting now another thing would be there are times when there are zero day issues as well so session days session hijacking could happen with because of those issues as well so you never know so keep changing your passwords make sure if you are logging in at someone else system you log out properly and don't give your passwords so these are some basic hygiene things okay uh, then in previous ppt you have mm -hmm. mentioned critical infrastructure security right so uh, what such kind of devices are there to protect such kind of uh, critical infrastructure like uh, for for example it's a uh, uh, firewall maybe or anything yes. else ips i yes i yes i think there is someone who has asked this question um okay. so what this person has asked that would you please share some information about id idps and detection of unknown or zero day attacks okay now when you talk about infrastructure security there are monitorings that we can do to start off so firewall it used to be the perimeter security where it's okay. like the boundary right boundary yes, yes, but think yes. of cloud can you have a boundary for cloud no because mm -hmm. when you log in when you go to cloud the first thing you get is username and password can you put a firewall on username and password you can't you can put a firewall only after you log in you have some servers you have some virtual machines there and then you log in like in aws you call it as ec2 machines so you have to be very cautious now when you monitor those servers what you can do is you can detect issues like ids intrusion detection system and then something called intrusion prevention system that's not related to application security but that's related to more of infra and network security now what if i have to give an example when i learned way back how my mentor told me about ids 
ideas is like a post mortem that we are doing on a murder i know it sounds absurd but that that's how i he told me so it said it's like a post mortem that you're doing after the murder because it has happened it's just detecting and now you're trying to see the logs and see what's happening or it detects and then you later figure out okay this is something which is happening and i need to stop prevention system is like the us police where even before sometimes happen they are there and they figure out okay this could happen so prevention system will have a tap it blocks the malicious content then and there now about zero day attacks it's very sketchy zero days attacks are called zero days because they are not known before so nobody knows them before somebody has figured out very very fresh and reported it and people are getting to know so those are zero day attacks and sometimes your um cyber threat intel can detect those zero day attacks early on your knowledge around connecting those things can detect early on now another thing about um so another thing about it is that we have firewalls just to check in and out the information what is going out what is coming in we have ids ips to monitor or to stop it then we have sim solutions s i e m security information and event management so any event that is happening we have made we have created certain rule sets it detects it it gives us a view that okay these are the issues so you can put in your all ids ips logs your vulnerability issue logs and your sim solution and people do monitor it those teams are called soc teams security operations center teams they were 24 cross 7 and monitor them i hope i answered your question um yes ma'am yes ma'am okay now i'm going to another question can we give live session of um, session hijacking oh absolutely so uh, um i wouldn't take a name here but let's say i am speaking with um, snehal sir for example snehal sir become friend with me so don't take it otherwise but um, i generally give such example so i'm speaking with you now you are my friend i send you a link i said can you check if it, if link this link is working and i've crafted uh, a url such a way that when you click on it all your cookie sessions would be sent to me now you click on that link the the magic of that url starts working and i get all your sessions and there would be one website who have not implemented proper session management which means if you have a cookie i should not be able to reuse it only your browser should be able to use it if the cookie is used in some other browser it will not work but i am able to use for one of the sessions that's called session hijacking and even this is called csrf client side request forgery i am giving you a link you are clicking on it and sending details to me and at the same time it can be cross site scripting as well now what is cross site scripting for example you have facebook.com or you have let's say um so i have infosecvandana.com that's my website now if my website is vulnerable to cross site scripting and um, you have an input field where you can talk to me there's a input field that you can send me an email you put a, a script in the uh, text form instead of your content and as soon as it reaches me i see that there's script and it start executing that's called cross site scripting so when a third party script is working on your server that's called cross site scripting why an attacker can run script on your server who it can impact clients only it can impact only users because script only runs on the client script does not run on the server they might go to the server but it only gets executed on the client side you can check about it all the scripts run on the client side now i have talked about cross site scripting how do you use for session hijacking now let me come back and show you something okay there's another question can ml technique used to alert the unknown attack patterns it can or it may it depends on the kind of ml technique techniques you are you have um we build a model for one of the medical things around um r and python 
and uh, they were giving different results. So you, you, you don't know if it gives, but it depends. It totally depends what kind of techniques you have. Because if I'm using an ML technique and I'm saying, oh, I can detect everything, trust me, that's not be the case. If you think cybersecurity is easy, it's a facade. If you think it's difficult, no, it is not. But it's not easy as well. So you have to be very question, cautious about it. You have to try and test it out. And not everything can be detected by ML techniques. Now, what I'm going to do is, um, sir, can I start off my second session or do we need to give break? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you can start. Uh, do you need or, break? Or I'll just we give can... a few minutes break. Yes, we can take a five to ten minutes break. It's Is sure, it okay, ma'am? Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. So participants will be back after, uh, uh, let's say today we'll take a small break, five minutes. After five minutes, we'll meet. I'll start the timer.
okay uh, welcome back yeah uh vanna ma'am over to you ma'am sure sir yeah so sir there are a few questions that are there yeah sure ma'am let me just pick up the those questions um that there are people who say that i lost my phone and there's a two factor authentication uh and the contact number sim on the phone can break into i would share all of these answers later on if that's okay because yes, i want to give proper examples yes sure ma'am perfect now i want to share and and all of those questions would be answered while i share my uh, share these details so who are application security specialist so application security people who work on application securing the applications in any form be it code be it the apps uh, the website which is on the internet could be like facebook google or the software apps which are there on your phone or on your systems and uh, people who could be called as ethical hacker or application security architects so there are multiple things multiple terms which are there in the industry for example devsecops i will let you read this ppt for a uh, presentation for a for a minute so think of what you have read here right now that application security people who are familiar with the context of infra security why do we call it as because it's interrelated if i say that i'm a security person or i just know application security trust me it won't work out it would not work out i need to know a little bit aspects of all of these things and now people call it as devsecops automate things and what not now what is that is basically you need to have a bits and pieces of everything like literally everything uh what you're doing on phone what devices are you using what is there with you now while i say all of that there are some critical domains related to appsec the first one to start off is what networks you are using what is the network segmentation how networks are there for example you're using cloud now cloud has a bigger infrastructure and what network are you using you need to know about that and then i am what is identity and access management identity and access management is big part of the ecosystem now if let's say you have a username and password and i start using it and would you like it you wouldn't like it or if i have a username and password somebody gets to know my password and start using it so nobody would love it similarly for organization when they give these i am um accesses they talk about authentication when you log in like college might have given you a username and password then authorization what access do you have that's called authorization you shouldn't be, you should only be able to check your emails not your professor's email so all of these things and availability that's very very important then something called sdlc sdlc is nothing but software development life cycle what is that you get to know okay you need to write a web application what code would you be using what platform you would be using wordpress or what kind of platform you would be using and then how it will go to the internet where the database would be stored security for the database configuration and change management that what kind of configuration we would be there or if there is any change that you want to do it what will be the bugs that will be there and how would you fix it so interestingly i'm not going to spend too much time on it these are just terms which are there which people need to know that okay pen tester is a big term when we talk about application and network security what does pen tester do they test the applications and they give you the bugs not just scanning but testing out like an attacker now even that's been categorized into different names so there are architects 
who design your applications. There are executives who support you. And then there are application architects who actually design the flow, where the data is coming from, where it is going, where what we need security as in. Like if you need, we were talking about IDS IPS, we were talking about firewalls, where it will be placed. So application security architects would design where a web application firewall would be placed. Now application, web, that, that's your homework. Read about web application firewalls. What are they? They really help. And why they are helping in the emerging technologies. Now this, this, oh, uh, this um, picture has been taken from the internet. You will be able to find it that, okay, there's an internet. There's a load balancers which manage the load. There are firewalls even before load balancers sometimes. Most of the time they are there. And then with load balancer, you have things in DMZ. DMZ is nothing but demilitarized zone where it's between internet and the internal infra. So it's in the middle. Sometimes you access your emails via DMZ zone. So nobody would have, not external people would have access to it. Maybe via VPN or maybe via certain username and password, you would be able to access. And then the internal server. It's just that you need to understand that architecture. It's very, very important to know what you have. When I test any application, I get to know what it is. So uh, you need to know. Now, what is DevSecOps? Development, security team, operations team working together. That's called DevSecOps. Now, there are security architects, application architects, whatnot, who work together to build these DevSecOps processes. So we need to have an understanding of how we do it. When you go to the day job, in any organization, you would hear, hear this term very frequently, even if you are researching. Now, I would let you read this slide once. Now, you, when you read this slide, there are different terms which are there. Waterfall, agile, hybrid, static code analysis, writing policy, and what not. So all of these things are very, very big. Now, why they are big, especially when we talk about application security, because that's how application security has been evolved, because it's covering every aspects of the application development. Once you write the code, but the code has issues you've sent it to the production or to the functional testing team. They test the functionality they, that goes to the website. Now on the website, there are issues. Now you go back the whole process and it takes time and money. Um, what I'll do is I realize that some of you might not be aware about the SDLC process. So I'll start off. What happens is that there's uh, snails has said that I want this website to be built. He comes to me and say that, can you build it? Now. I design it first, that how would it look? What would it have? Whether it'll have a username and password, whether it'll have no username and password, what kind of content it will. So I'll create an architecture document. Then I will share it with developers. So developers, they write the code using certain language, could be Java, Python, PHP, or anything that you like, um, or Node.js. Now, when you write the code, after that, what happens is, after writing that code, the code is being tested to check if everything is okay. Then it's being sent to the functional testing team to check the functionality and it will look like as it's on the internet. So that's the job of the functional testing team to check every feature. Then it goes to the internet and everyone uses it. That's a very simple process, but there are many things associated. So for everything that you have, every part of it will have security associated with it. And that's where security would come into picture. Now that will also want the database security to be there. What data would be going at the back? And this is where I would be covering the top 10 issues in databases and whatnot. It also talks about compliances. Now what are compliances? When, for example, you need to comply with something. If college says that you need to have 80% attendance for the papers, for exams, which means you'll have to come 80% of the time, attend all the classes, maybe virtually, maybe, coming to the college. So you have that. Similarly, in the industry, for keeping data secure, 
transaction secure, your credit card secure. There are different compliances. GDPR is very famous in Europe. It's for European region. You can look up that what is that. Then you have PCI DSS. Now this is for most of the places, especially US came up with that. So PCI is payment card industry, data security standard. So it's for any organization using payment, payment cards like credit cards. So they have to comply with that. HIPAA is basically for um, hospitals, for medical records. Now, apart from that, when we talk about configuration and change management, anything that's changed within the organization that has to be documented, within the application that has to be documented, or if something happens, who will know about that? Now, threat and vulnerabilities, I'm not gonna spend more time here because I have to cover those questions as well. So you already know about it because we read it in the first uh, presentation that we did, that anybody, who has a system could have vulnerabilities, but threats which may be possible attacks. Like I may be threat to some people because I'm in cybersecurity, but then I have a way wherein I think negative a lot of times. And I certainly think what can go wrong with that? So I may be threat or maybe somebody, your friend might be a threat to your uh, passwords if you share it. Now, there are people who are full stack application security specialists because they work on the full stack. So you, if you want to talk about application security, you need to have an understanding how the apps are built. People used to say that you don't need to know about your code, but if you know your code well, trust me, nobody can beat you in application security. So that's very, very important to have. And another thing is when we talk about application security, uh, there are threats which keep coming up. There are threats which actually keep you awake. So one of them, one of those things is OWASP has come up with these top 10 risks. Now, OWASP is one of the biggest application security communities. But what it does is that it actually take out the information from a lot of organizations, gather it, process it through ML, come up with top 10 risks, share it with the community, get the votes, and then publish it to the people. And it's not an easy task. It takes years to do it. So every three to four years, OWASP releases top 10 risks, and it's been 20 years they have been doing it. And, and, and it's an honor to, to me to be part of the big community. But how did I get to know? I got to know about community in 2012. Uh, was when I went for one of the trainings and somebody said, do you know about OWASP top 10? I said, no. Then they were like, okay, this is it. This you should know. And I started my application security journey. An interesting aspect that I realized it's more than top 10. It's a big community. It's people. It's not just top 10 list. So um, it, it really helped me. Now, when these top 10 risks came, it comes in a PDF. It comes... Uh, in a mobile format, it comes uh, as like a documentation which can help you. Now, apart from that, when it comes with top 10 risks, it says that these are risks. You have to have, um, you have to know about what other things can impact your web application. Now, what could be those? Now, those could be wherein, um, maybe SQL injection, maybe cross-site scripting. But let me just go back to one important aspect. Whereas how the data is collected, data is analyzed, reviewed, and these OWASP top 10 come into picture. So industry people share information, share the actual data, vendors share the actual data from security teams, and then the data is analyzed. There are write-ups that are created, Reviews are done, translations are done in different languages, and then these things are created. Now, apart from this, what is the making? Let's come here. What do you think would be broken access control? Do you think that this could be an issue? I am going to share a perspective from a very layman person. Like you don't know about OWASP top 10, and I'm starting to share. Some of you might already know it, but if you don't know, let me start there. When top 10 big world risks in the industry, in applications. So your access. Um, 
a, I'll give you an example of one time what happened is that I was able to log in and everything was working. And then my boss said, um, we are creating a new system wherein all the hikes would be managed. So all the hikes for the organization, like money, it involves monetary things. Any There's some amount of money that's being allocated to president. President gives it to directors, VPs. VPs gives it to the managers. Managers give it to team lead. Team lead give it to their people. So it's a hierarchy. Now, if let's say I'm an employee, I'm an employee, I'm only supposed to access certain data, my salary hike, not everybody else. But if I'm able to see what has been allocated to my manager, would I be happy? Or would I know how much money is being given to him and how much money he's keeping, how much money he's giving to other people? I would get to know. Would you want it? No. Similarly, if let's say mark system, certain marks should be given to certain students. Like it's like a curvy role. It used to be there when only one can be a topper. So how much marks we can allocate? Then if let's say you've just given your papers, you can see only your marks. But when you elevate your privilege, could be any way, and you access the ecosystem, access the website where your professor has given marks to everyone, you'll be like, why this person has got more marks than me? And that is such a no normal thing. Similarly, why this person is earning more than me? Why this person has got better rating than me? That's a very common thing. So broken access control thing is still very, very big. And trust me, that has been there since the day we started having accesses. Now, any questions? Participants, do you have any questions related to OS top 10? Ma'am, I think you didn't open the OS top 10 PPT, I guess. Is it? Yeah. Oh my God. Let me just share it. Sorry. Can you okay. see? It? Yeah, now, now it's working. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I thought you are in the uh, that mode only to open the PPT. Oh, yeah, I, I realized that I didn't share it, or I only shared one specific page where uh, I'm yes. so sorry for that. Yes, no, no issue, ma'am. No, it's okay. Uh, so, can you show us that top 10 so that uh, uh, participants can see that in the PPT? Yes, absolutely. So, this yeah. is the first one. So, broken access control is the first one. And I'll show you uh, OWASP.org page. Yes. Here, you can go and check all the projects. Right. Okay. Here. Mm -hmm. So OSP is sharing always the weaknesses, always uh, for the four years of durations, uh, they are releasing the weaknesses in the uh, top 10 weaknesses, right, ma'am? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. I mean, security risk. Yes, yes. So currently 2021 is uh, going on. And previously there was the 20, uh, 2017. Yes, done ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Any any questions from the participants about the OSP top 10? You can write in the chat box or you can speak. Okay, ma'am, you can go ahead, ma'am, for the next mm -hmm. one. Sure, sure. Yes. Yeah. So every 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 industry, I mean, uh, for the security industry, they are following OS top ten, right, ma'am? To secure the uh, web applications and all. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yes, so absolutely, absolutely, and, absolutely. Yes. yes. This and applies how, to everyone. 
Yes, ma'am. And how can we uh, contribute to the OSP? By doing research okay. and... Is there any direct way? I hope I'm audible, right? So what happens is... What happens is that it's not country specific. It's the whole organization. It's it's worldwide. Okay, okay. So, yes, absolutely. I'll take care of it. Yeah. So, sir, uh, this is like everyone can use it. Everyone, every industry, every sector from transportation to application security to everything. They want it. They have to use this. Yeah, true, ma'am. And this is very helpful to resolve the security loopholes and all. And now they have started with the different, different area like IOTs and cloud securities top 10 also. We can find the different top 10 in the different areas. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, think of it as like, sir, um, because these are so common issues, they have been taken into uh, account by when, like from the vendors, uh, could which are security vendors so they work with airline they work with healthcare they work with payment card like the companies who use card banks they you they they are part of the organizations which are uh, even the small business so it impacts everyone if let's say um i have a small business like i have a startup and that gets breached do i need security Absolutely. So anyone and everyone needs application security. They need to have these issues. And that's why we need to understand. So the first one is broken access control, wherein access is not being managed properly. Another interesting aspect is cryptographic failures. They're not very common, but then there are big issues. Uh, there was one question now I want to answer about HTTPS and SSL. Let me just get to that question. Um, Okay, uh, that what I understand having secure cookies, so this is a question by someone, what I understand that having secured cookies are the only solution we have against the HTTP and SSL issues. Trust me, not that's not the only solution. Even S uh, cookies will have to have some tags to be secure. So if we talk about sensitive data exposure, for example, I buy a mistake, shared some data on the internet. Will it be secure? No. I'm supposed to keep it secure with username and password, with authentication, with authorization, and not everyone should have access to it. It has to be internal. And but, it, but right now it's public. Or when I want to encrypt the most confidential data, I've not encrypted. Will it be secure? No, it will not be secure. I am not using effective TLS. I'm using TLS, transport layer security for the website, but I'm using an older version. Will I be secure? I will still have issues. Or like I said, configuration, I am using an insecure password. So you're using good, you're not sharing your password, but you're using your password as your, um, your mother's name or your name at your birthday or your best friend's name at your birthday. Trust me, that's so common. People still use July at one, two, three, July at this, July at that, August. Uh, we, right now we are in November. People do use November at something, something, something. Trust me, those are so common passwords, which lead to these issues. Now, when we talk about top 10 issues, they don't just come up with single thing. There are multiple test cases associated with it. For example, right now, as PhD scholar, you have to narrow down as more, as better as possible. You have to narrow down your research. Now, when you narrow down your research, you go down to a level that you go to the extreme extent. Okay, there's a big cybersecurity industry. You're choosing application security. In application security, you choose cryptographic failure. In cryptographic failure, what kind of cryptographic fail failure you would have? 
you choose that and what test cases you would be building on top of it that's the kind of research that people are doing if you see there are certain vulnerability exposures or vulnerability exposure information for example if i have one issue access issue there are many ways that it can be exploited somebody getting to know my password i'm using insecure password i'm not using alphabets i'm not using numbers i'm not using special characters i'm using a short password i'm not using a long password so there can be n number of things test cases would you remember everything trust me i would not remember the conversation i will have with you right now if i will not give examples so i'll be just dozing off i will even forget about it so what i do is i go through the oas top 10 risks and then there is a testing guide associated with it where i just pick up the testing guide and start getting to read about them rather than just looking at this slide and forgetting about it like this happens with anyone if you give me slides i'll forget it i will not even read about it again till the time it interests me now on top of it if you don't tell me that where i can find the relevant information it will not work now coming back to the topic injection is an, another big flaw of a was top 10 now why such a big flaw think of it as a situation um you have an application there's a database and you are able to modify or you are able to fetch anything from a database um or a friend of mine what this friend did um her son was studying in a certain school what she wanted to check the results the results were out she checked the website she was not able to access it properly because a lot of people were checking she was a sql developer check created a script to access details from the database and she thought could be this parameter is creating issue let me just delete it idly she is not a developer for the school she is working at the office but she writes the script runs it on the website and it works the table gets deleted which brings down the whole website nobody is able to access it now can we blame the lady can we blame the school that they don't have the sql injection protection or whom we can blame now you are going to check your results and you are getting access to all the results how cool that would be like that'll be amazing i would want to see everyone results even though sometimes it's private so sql injection is nothing but when an application take inputs from the user in the form of a query not just sql query it's injection so it could be command injection could be sql injection like a sql query could be any other injection or os injection so when an application take input from the user does not validate see validation is very very important and start sending it to database and database process it now when i tell you all some information you say oh vandana said that and you start believing it and when i have when i by mistake by mistake said some wrong thing and now you say it out loud to everyone and if you start using it it will be like oh vanna said it so it will be true but then is it true that you have to check now how you can check it if you are a security person you can check the design documents and vet it out if you are a developer then you have to check how the application has been developed what language or uh what language has been used to develop when you have used a certain language if there are inputs from the users let's say what input um i am feeding into the website for example now i know these are so many jargons so sorry for that but um in example rajkot university has a login page for students now when you log in it does not validate who you are or maybe it validates your username and password and then later on gives you access but in the url you see your name you remove your name and you type snehal sir's name and you are able to access snehal sir's page snehal sir's email how cool that would be you have a username and password you are protected 
but then design was insecure. It was not designed in such a way that somebody should not be able to access someone else's account just by changing the username, right? Nobody should have access to it. And that has been the case for a very long time earlier. Now those things don't exist completely because they, they have happened with multiple people. Still, multiple applications, they missed out on certain parameters. So for that, what we can do is we need to read the design of what we are writing. For example, if I have to talk from a PhD scholar perspective, you create your uh, research document. You create your first research or literature review. When you create your literature review, it's a sort of a design document that what you've done so far. And in that, you write all the papers that you've reviewed, all the journals that you have reviewed, or any academic conference that you've attended, or any academic conference paper that you've reviewed. You write everything about that. Now, while you do that, you create a proper design. This is how I went through. This was the whole process. That's actually somewhat in design process. But if you miss out on certain aspects, it might give, not give you the right kind of narrow down research, research perspective or your research topic. So you have to be very cautious about that. Now, misconfiguration. This is my favorite. Trust me, this is my favorite. Now, I logged into the website. I said, I'm going to come back again. So I'm going to just say, remember my password. My brother comes up, checks, open the website, goes on to the website to log in into his account and sees my account starts playing with that, starts reading the emails. Like, wow, whom are you chatting with? What sessions are you giving? Where are you traveling? All those details. Funny enough, that should happen with anyone. It should not happen with anyone. Similarly, in cloud, if there is a uh, database where we have stored the code, where we have stored the files, where we have stored the results documents or legal documents, I have not secured it properly and it's public. So anyone who tries to scrap it, ch check out, they will be able to figure it out. Do you want that information? Or you have uploaded your pictures on Instagram or Facebook and you forgot to make them private to your friends. Now it's public. Anyone can come to your profile and view your pictures. Would you want it? It was an unintentional security misconfiguration, but you've done it. You did not keep your security and privacy settings. Another thing is that you have a phone and you don't update it after even getting an update. It is like using a vulnerable component. You, you know about it and you still use it. So that is so common with organizations. They start using open source components and there are issues and they don't fix it. What happens? The breaches, the, the attacks. Now, what are breaches? Nothing, but somebody gets to know your passwords. Somebody gets to know your details and start playing around with it. And breaches don't just cost the brand name. It costs money. It costs data. You have your pictures. Now, somebody, you've made the account private, but they have but the the website, for example, you are on so-and-so social media, you uploaded some pictures, the, the website gets hacked. All your pictures are public. And you're like, I don't want them to be public. Remove it, remove it, remove it. And they don't remove it. What will you do? You can't do anything. The attackers will have that information. So important bit is to you for organizations to keep their websites updated. Make sure the security and privacy settings you as the individual are taking care of. Not everything you can take care of, but certain basic hygiene you can take care of. Now, another thing associated with the, author, uh, the broken access control is authentication. Your authentication itself is broken. You're using insecure passwords. Can anybody stop anyone to access into your account? I'll do social engineering. I'll be your friend and I'll get to know your passwords. I'll sit next to you. I'll keep peeping into your system when you're typing your passwords and you'll be, I'll be able to get into your accounts. 
So what I do is I use multi-factor authentication. I use vaults. I use password managers so that I don't have to type my password everywhere. Similarly, we need to have proper authentication. We need to have proper session management. Now, what do you mean by press, proper session management? Think of a situation wherein I have a session and that session is not being maintained properly. Like there's a logout button which is there, but the session does not get invalidated from the server. So when I click a back button and I'm logged in again. So you log in, log out, you hit the back button and you're logged in again. Does that ha Should that happen? It should never ever happen. So there has to be proper session timeout uh, from the server. Or give me, let me give you a bank scenario. You log into your bank account, check your money, log out. Your brother comes, hit the back button, able to log into your bank account. Sees, oh, you have this much money. Or your friends get to know. Then they say, oh, let me give, let's give us the party. So that these are some basic etiquettes, basic cybersecurity hygiene, which we need to follow as an organization or when we are designing applications. Then there are integrity failures wherein we do not keep the integrity. There are systems which actually lack that thing because we are using outdated components. We are not keeping the checks at the right place. We don't keep the checkpoints. Oh, okay, I have the security here. Why do I need it there? So those kind of things actually make it very, very critical. Another thing is that logging and monitoring. We were talking about IDS and IPS. That's why we need IDS and IPS so that we can go back and see when the breach happened, who responded to it, who was the person involved so that we can just lock out their ID and stop the breach there itself and reset the password, how we can clean it up. So it's very, very important to log and monitor anything. If you don't do it, trust me, no one can help you out. Now, the last but not the least, the top 10 risk is server-side request forgery. Trust me, they are jargons. It took me time to understand. Maybe I might not be able to make you understand so well, but after the session, you can reach out to me on my LinkedIn, Twitter. I'll be happy to have a discussion further as well. Because two-hour session is like, I give the, these sessions in like two days. It's a two-day training program that I give. So I know that in two hours, we might not be able to complete everything, but I'm just giving you a, a, a sneak peek to it so that you understand what it is. Now, server-side request forgery is like, um, with an example I'll show. Uh, there was one uh, Capital One bank here in U.S., so in US, what happens is that when you use Capital One, there are credit cards that are being provided, like we do it with HDFC, ICICI. So that was fine. But this person wanted to upload, uh, wanted to get a new card with the cat's picture. Like who gets the picture on the card? But now that's so common. So instead of uh, the picture of the cat, this person saw that the, the picture is getting saved at some location which was AWS location, did the lookup and realized that that link is giving him access to all the pictures which are stored there. Started doing all the reverse engineering, started checking out more, realized that it is giving access to other cards as well. Now, if I have your card and your CVV, I'm rich. You're in US, absolutely. You can use the card and just place your order. If I if I buy an iPhone where people say, oh, you have to sell your kidney to buy an iPhone. Literally, that's the case. If you get tons and tons of credit cards and that too, you publish it on the internet. How crazy that would be. So the lady who found out, posted it on the internet. It was one of the biggest breach around, one of the biggest breach of Capital One. You can look up. And that happened because of server-side request forgery. I could run things on the server and server giving me details. Oh, this is what you want. Let me give it to you. So anything, for example, right now, I am I'm becoming your friend. And then I keep asking you certain details about Rajkot University. And you keep giving me all those details. Sort of that kind of thing. Now, apart from that, it is just the minimum thing 
around the application security program that people run. But when we talk about developers, when we talk about people who are part of the application ecosystem, they need to have an understanding of architecture, understand where the threats can come from. If you have a house, there are windows, there are doors. How would you make sure that you, when you go on a vacation, your doors are also locked? Your windows are also locked. Even if there's one window open, anyone can come in and do whatever they want to do. So be very, very cautious about that. Another aspect is that proactive controls. So these are some controls which you can put it early on, which have been created. So you can learn about these proactive controls from the website itself. I would be sharing that what are the basic security things that you can do it in your projects, in your uh, things that you do. Now, this is about OWASP top 10. Now, I'm going to stop here and take up any questions before I move on to the further things. Yes, respected faculty members and uh, students, please post if you are having any questions. Any questions that you have? Okay, uh, I think I have some questions. Uh, as debit card require PIN or stay, say OTP? Tr let me tell you when in one interesting aspect. If you do international transaction, it never asks for an OTP. So it will never ask for an OTP. My Google, my GitHub, they never ask me for an OTP. It just happened, the transactions happen. Because that's how the ecosystem has been built here in US. And even when I go to, uh, to the grocery stores, they might not ask me for my pen. They just tap it and then it's debited. Or they put the card in and it's done. It's, it's, it's a kind of the practice that they follow. Um, now, there were other questions that I want to take up now. Um, it's about updated browser. I'll tell you funny thing that not every time I update my browser, but the browser should be always up to date. If you don't do it, what will happen? For example, there's an update button that will come here. If you see that, make sure you update it because that means there are certain things that have been updated and you should keep your system up to date as well. Or what happens? There are security related bugs in browser as well. There have been cases where there are malwares in the extensions, browser extensions. If you have an extension which has issue, the, system, the Chrome has sent an update or Edge has sent an update and you've not updated, which means you will have that vulnerability and nothing you can do about because you're using systems. Now, for this one, for this presentation, we're talking about modern AppSec. You would be talking about SQL injection again, XSS, CSRF, more boring stuff. I know sometimes it's boring. And then we will just be taking up questions. So we will also be covering modern AppSec issues with some cool examples because I love giving examples. I love relating it to the, the things that I have at home. So think of this. This, this is like the, the traditional things, Yahoo website. And uh, we started using Yahoo like way, way long back. So this was normal, the app that we started using. But the new things is that, that we have started using drives. We've started using new services. And things have changed. Earlier, it was client, web server, fetch the data and the web server starts running. Now, the HTL com things are on client, but here, the, with the new APIs, there's a single API which does a job where client connects with the web server API. The API connects with the server. There's a JSON which has been sent to the client and the whole communication happens. It's a very simple thing where there are APIs to do multiple tasks. You want things to be in a fraction of seconds. Earlier, 
I'll tell you what happened, what used to happen. In the beginning of my career, uh, six months or one year, sometimes one application used to take to get built. As part of security, so I was invited to all the parties. Um, but once after six months, these parties used to be so big that the one day off would be there for the teams. Think of a situation wherein it changes. There are multiple releases, multiple features are being built in a day. There are multiple things are being done in a week. How fast that would be, like the lightning speed. And another interesting aspect is that, that people or organization want things to be super fast, super quick, like really, really quick. So I also want things to be quick, like fetch the details as soon as possible, connect with bots to people, what not do we want to do it? We have many technologies. Now we talked about DevSecOps, we want APIs, we want this, we want new platforms, we want Kubernetes, we want Docker containers, we want cloud and everything which is there. So the good news is that these things have issues, but they can also be, be, uh, be fixed by using different things. Like CSRF people say, if you use authorization header, it can be fixed. For XSS, who is responsible? Us. But server is also responsible. The application is also responsible to have proper tags. And which website I visit. When we talk about these APIs, application programming interface, they're giving us very, very big place to play around. It's like a playground and we are doing different things. For username and password, for authentication, there's one API. For authorization, there's another API. For doing some work, there's one API. For doing that work, there's one API. There are multiple APIs, but the attack surface has also become increased. You need to safeguard every API. Don't overshare. Like, I am supposed to share certain content with you. I am supposed to share only certain details about myself with you. But what happens is that I keep sharing. Oh, I live here. I have these many kids. I have this these people at home. I am uh, uh, active on these social media. I do this. Trust me, I do that a lot of times. But I only share what I want to share. I am very, very mindful of that. Oh, you are predictable. Oh, you are at this place. Oh, you are at this person. Trust me, whatever is on social media is not always the same. But there are certain people who are so predictable that you get information about anything and everything there. So there are people who have contributed to it. So OWASP API project, these two people have contributed. They have come up with API project. And these are the top 10 issues wherein we can break down the issues to object level as well. When you create an object uh, API, you need objects. Using objects, you run an API. Now you can you can have issues in those objects itself. Authentication. For authenticating an, an um, no, no, no. Let me put it with an example. Now you authenticate using an API. Now API has misconfiguration. So anyone can use that API to log in into the system. And it's a critical system. How cool that would be. I want to log into any banking system and, how, and see how much money they, they have in the bank. But that should not happen from a security perspective. Or excessive data exposure. Do I need to have access to the, the name of the students who are part of certain program at a certain college or Rajkot University? I should not have. But what it is that we're still getting access to all the names of the students. Another thing is that uh, rate limiting is again, a big thing wherein uh, if I am supposed to access only four resources, I should only have access to four key sources, not five. It should be very much constrained. If let's say I am authorizing an API to access my username and password, my database, but it is accessing other databases as well and giving me all the other details. I would love it, but it is not good for application. So these mass assignments, security misconfiguration, e e injection, all of these things, they're almost the same as apps, the applications, but sometimes they're broken down very, very specific for microservices and APIs. 
So these authorization in APIs is a big challenge because it's a code level issue. It's a functional level issue. You need to understand what kind of API you are using, what kind of content you are using, and that only you can fix all of these issues. Now, we still have some time wherein I'm going to share some information and then I'm going to take up questions. So here, let me do this. Let me open this, my favorite thing about Cloud Native. Now, with Cloud Native, let me talk about the digital transformation. Every company that you think about, Walmart to JP Morgan to Uber to even Rajkot University, all of these companies, all of these universities, everyone, they want to go digital. I want to go digital. And that's why we are having this online session. But when we want to go digital, you want to submit your projects online. Why? Because everyone wants to do things for the tech. Now, when that happens, it requires a change. It requires certain system to monitor it. It requires a big transformation. But for that, we need to have follow certain principles. What kind of principles? There are certain teams that need to work together. For example, the Rajkot University has um, um, a program where students write the website code or update the code. So they need to make sure that they are adhering to security practices. Now, if you want to know more about scaling operations, this is one of the best book that I've read about it. And it's amazing by Nicole Forgreen. And there's another book, um, one second, not here. So there's another book that I'm going to be sharing called Phoenix Project. If you want to know about the app stack, application stack, or how the whole DevSecOps works, DevOps work, trust me, Phoenix Project is one of the best book that you can read. And it is like, not just because I'm talking about security, but it's not touching upon more on security, but on the project perspective only. If you want to know about apps and even in-depth application development, trust me, that's one beautiful book. And I think everyone should know about if you're working in the technical digital world. So moving on from there, we talk about cloud. Interestingly, cloud is nothing but someone else's server and we are using it. But it's more secure because it's easy. Um, people used to say, oh, I am in my office and it's secure. But think of a situation now from past three years. I am remote. I'm working remotely. All of the sessions that I'm taking remotely, all of the calls that I'm taking remotely. So things have moved to cloud. For the companies who are not even thinking of who are not even thinking of moving to cloud, banks, they have made their operations online, like they've moved their servers online. The small startups to medium businesses, they never thought that they will go, go on cloud, but now they are. There are certain limitations. There are certain things that have changed. For example, earlier we were buying the hardware. It used to take months to come to the office. Then you have to configure. You'll have to wait for the person to configure. And then this person will, will actually give you the details. Then you use it. If it goes down, you'll have to call the person again. Now, those things have changed. If you see all the libraries, app code, open, uh, open source software, cloud, containers, the virtual machines, everything is on cloud. You just need to make sure that what you post on the cloud, you manage it properly like the responsibility of yours and especially if i talk about applications the configuration management is one big challenge in the cloud which you need to manage and that's why people call it as dev first cloud native security where developers need to get involved with application security the people who are writing it need to get involved now what is dev first security considered as like you're writing a code and you don't know about security. Now, when you post it, people start using it. And suddenly an attacker comes and says, oh, I got you. They download all the users, all the credit card information and bring down your website. Would you like it? No, you would be in trouble. And instead of a case, you are writing a code for your project. You're writing it securely and nobody can actually access the things which you don't want it, them to. And everybody is like, kudos. This is what should be there. So developers and security testers or auditors, they have a different perspective. Developers understand the app and we understand the risk issues. So which side of it you want to be, you'll have to be very cautious about it. You'll have to have a very clear understanding of it. And 
developers like using developer tools. For example, for our project work, if let's say for checking plagiarism, we don't use Turnit, we use something else. But with Turnit, you get certain results that this is the plagiarism level. So professors like to use that tool, but you are using that tool, there could be a discrepancy in that. Similarly, for developers and security people, if security people start using developer tools to log security issues, how cool would be that for them? Interesting would be that for them. It'll be solving half of the issues. Now, another issue, another question was logging, finding, fixing. Logging is very, very important. If you find security issues, if you find a bug, not even security issues, if you find a bug in your code, you don't log it or you don't keep a tab on it and you don't fix it, trust me, it's as good as not finding it. You didn't do anything. So it's it's important you take an ownership, you understand how you're going to be involving it. Similarly for an organization, who would be fixing it? How is the approach? Who should be involved? That's very, very important. And let's also talk about cloud native application security. Now, what is that? For example, we have containers, we have code, we have infrastructure as a code. Now I'll tell you what is infrastructure as a code. If you've heard about a term called Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, what you do is you actually spin up multiple containers. It could be Docker containers or other containers. Docker container is the name of type of a container. So you, you start spinning multiple uh, containers and start using your application. Or in a very simple layman person, there's a sale going on on Amazon. Now, Amazon's server starts to crash. But what they have is Kubernetes and they start to spin up more servers so that the load goes on those other servers and they, they keep the website running on the, um, um, on the internet at the time of the sale. When you are when you're checking the sale time, trust me, everyone wants to buy. I want to buy everything. I want to buy everything that I have in my cart, what I want to buy. And as soon as it launches, because then the sale goes off, the product goes out of stock. And if this website is down, what will I do? I can't do anything. And I don't want the websites to be down when there's a sale as a user. So that's what organization want. And that's where we need to have an understanding how exactly we can secure those Kubernetes containers and what we need to do. I'm not getting into container security. Just wanted to tell you that how containers are being spin up. So this is like the, the basic things that we that 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 are there for example i have a vm virtual box so when i give a training the hands on training i use alpine linux it's a part of a linux foundation so i use alpine linux which is a lightweight linux operating system on top of it i run certain apps could be node.js app could be java app or could be anything but as part of a container and container images can be downloaded from the container registries. Those are called like a database of operating system and you download a certain operating system like Linux or Windows or Mac OS, you download it from certain place, right? Similarly for container image, you have to have a proper container re registry. That's called registry. Now the registry has a vulnerable image, which means your application will be vulnerable from the get go itself, from the beginning itself. So you have to be very cautious about that where you are getting the image. So container has to do a lot with its image and where you're downloading it from in a very nutshell. And then the infrastructure as a code. When we spin so many instances in one go, we can't afford to have issues in the configuration itself. If I have a configuration issue and anybody could access, access my server, oh, they will know that how many, how much products I have sold, what did I do, everything. So security perspective is critical but it won't get you people adoption. So what we need is we need to make it everyone's responsibility. And now I talk from an application security perspective. I'll tell you from a normal perspective. Like I told you about the Joomer thing. I, I hacked into my brother's Joomer. I hacked into a lot of other things. Like my father said, oh, you talk about security. Now I have a pattern. It took me 30 seconds, not even 30 seconds to remove his pattern and telling him, Oh, you have a smartphone and now you're gifting me that smartphone. So those kind of things. That's why we have these passcodes and we don't want to share it. 
Now you need to rethink about these application security things when you are in cloud because you talk about the new skills, the new security practices, the configurations and whatnot. Because when you talk about your code, this is the small code that you write. But what is the bigger picture is open source components to containers to what not we have like infrastructure as a code. So it's a big part of it. And cloud configuration, as I mentioned, is like big, big issue, which is there. That is create, letting us rethink about our priorities. So we have to look at code, open source code, containers to infrastructure as a code, which is building our app now. And that's why we are rethinking about tooling, dev tooling, platform space, and governing. We are having these issues. Now, in the end, what I want to do is empower yourself to learn about something that you have. Now, let me just go ahead and stop you, stop here and stop screen share and tell you something. If you are working on a project, if you don't know about it completely, you will never be able to do what you really want to do. So it's important to get to know where you want to head. Like professors say that research in depth, narrow down your topic. Why? Because they want you to make sure that you actually go down to the topic. So I'm going to stop here. I've given a lot of yarn. I'm sure some of it was boring. So I am opening up for questions. You can unmute yourself one by one, raise your hand and then unmute yourself. And we talk about it. So this is like a complete open and co question answer session. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, floor is open for you participants. You can ask the questions. Yes, Markan, do you have any question? Yes, sir. Uh, just wanted to know. Uh, well, ma'am, talk. Uh, ma'am, show me a, a slide of depends in depth. Can 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 she elaborate something about that? Sure. So when we talk about defense in depth, it means you go down to a level where you check about your access, IDS, IPS. You have all the right security things because you've checked your design. So you are somewhere around 90, 95% secure because no one is 100% secure. So you go down to a level where you understand everything about your ecosystem, how many users, who has access to what. Now, let me put it in a perspective where Google came, Google actually implemented something called zero trust. And they call it as beyond trust. Now, what is that is that you can work from anywhere in the world. You just don't need to work from office, but you can work from anywhere, literally anyone, anywhere from um, for the office. But then when you try and log into your internal servers, it validates certain certificates. If you have it, it'll work. If you don't have it, it will not work. So from your personal system, it will never work. From your username and password, it will work. But if you change your IP, for example, right now I'm working from US. I work from India. I work from Bangalore. And suddenly the, the things have changed. So it asked me to re-authenticate. So that's what I mean that go defense, defense should be in-depth. Understanding what assets we have, what data we have, what applications we have, and securing them. A lot of times organization don't keep a track of anything and everything they use as part of the application. I hope this answers your question. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, just wanted to know, uh, is secure secure coding or secure, uh, uh, secure uh, coding for or uh, secure coding basically uh, is dealing with some kind of defense in depth strategy also? Absolutely. That's also part of defense in depth. Some people say, that only monitoring like IDS, IPS, that's part of defense in depth, but no. Roles, authorization, authentication, it's also part of the defense in depth. All these part of defense in depth technologies. Mahakant, your voice is very low. Sorry, am I audible now? Yes. yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, okay. sir, so, uh, just wanted to know, uh, I was learning about uh, some kind of cloud security. What is hypervisor and some kind of, uh, can you elaborate, ma'am? See, I will talk about hypervisor in a very name and person term. 
So hypervisor is a virtualization technique, which has been there for ages, which gives us the platform where we can host the virtual machines. And that's not just for the cloud, but for even we have been using hypervisor for our old virtual machines as well. So in simple, it's a term to provide the virtual um, operating systems. For example, I am using a system, but then I want to use multiple systems on a system. So I use a virtualization platform like hypervisor, which lets me host multiple virtual machines. And on those virtual machines, I have multiple applications and it runs. I hope this makes sense. Yes. Yes. It's like you have an operating system. On top of that, you have an hypervisor. And on hypervisor, you have multiple operating systems running simultaneously on the same system. So that's how it works. Okay. One, one more last question. Uh, yes, please. Is JSON or, and YAML are same or some, some kind of difference is there? Which one? Y A M L. YAML. Okay, YAML, YAML. scripts. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so and JSON, JSON, they, and JSON. No, are they are different. different. They're completely different. YAML is a format. Similarly, JSON is a format. So they're different things. You okay. can convert a JSON to YAML or YAML to JSON, but these are two different things. Sure. These are different formats. They're not the same thing, not at all. So YAML files are used to spin up configurations for Kubernetes as well. And JSON, again, is a kind of format which is being used as script uh, in the websites or convert some things or uh, to order something. A lot of people use JSON in simple words. Yes, ma'am. Any further questions? Or the session was so boring? No, no, ma'am. Session was very informative, actually. It, it, it I, was sir, perfect, I understand ma uh, just, the first just time. Wanted to... Yes, please. Uh, we have learned a lot, ma'am. Uh, it's, it's really an informative session, and we have learned a lot, ma'am. Uh, in, in, in a two hour session, I know that uh, some things uh, might be flown from mind of some of people or if, my, if it is it is from my mind as well but yes ma'am uh, it's it's a really perfect session uh, just wanted to know uh, if you can provide some word of information of data privacy as well ma'am sure um so data privacy is something which we need as an organization which we need as a user and especially there was one bill which has been called off in india as well that call, uh, that was like data protection bill that was there that's not there anymore now there were big discussions that how the data should be handled by different organizations of the users so let's say i have i am collecting some data from the users their username passwords their credit card information their aadhar number pan numbers and i am sending it to somebody else should that happen now, I am giving you my Aadhaar, my personal information, my personal sensitive information, and you're sending it to somebody else. For example, you, you give your information on a certain website, and then a lot of marketing calls starts coming in. For example, you register on 99 acres, you're trying to rent a house, and then hundreds and hundreds of calls you get because that 99 acres have sent your data to somebody else as well. Would you want it? You don't want it because they say, oh, you want to buy furniture, you want to buy secondhand furniture, all of that. You don't want it. So data privacy is wherein you, your data is secure and is not shared with other people. And that's why multiple countries have different data privacy laws, bills, and whatnot. Like GDPR is one of the data protection guidelines in European region. California has... Uh, California protection bill. Can Canada has a certain privacy thing. Similarly, many countries have different privacy bills. So data privacy is to do with keeping the data private and only people who should have access to it should have. And when, let's say, 
if my data is with you and I want to delete my account and want to get my data removed, you remove everything. That has to do with data privacy. But not everyone does it. You don't have those strict measures to remove your data. Yeah. I hope this answers. Yes, ma'am, it's clear. Yes, any questions from the PhD scholars, faculty members? Then we'll wind up the session. Yes, any more questions? I'll give you two more minutes. Uh, you can ask the questions uh, in the chat box. You can unmute. Yeah, one number. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, I think uh, in, in your chat box, any uh, private question is there? I mean, no, uh, I think all the questions are answered okay, from my chat okay. box. Okay, okay, ma'am. So let me summarize, then uh, we'll wind up the session, ma'am, if you allow us. Sure, sir. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, ma'am, we have started with the why hack, why hacking. We started with the, uh, the, the types of hackers, hackers and cackers, crackers. Uh, you uh, discussed the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity and availability. That was really, uh, with the example, it uh, sounds good to understand the things of CIA triad. And that is the base of cybersecurity we should understand. Uh, we discussed about the threats and vulnerabilities, common hacking terminologies uh, that we discussed like key loggers, click jackings, ever dropping and so on. Uh, we discussed about the types of malwares uh, like spyware, adwares, ransomware, Trojan OS, viruses and bombs. Uh, that was a good uh, slide about the logic bomb uh, that uh, you shown and we discussed about the logic bomb also. Social networking security, that was again uh, uh, very impressive things. And we uh, we know, uh, we gone through with the different techniques, how we can care or we can take the awareness of the social securities, uh, social media securities. Uh, we discussed about the cyber ethics, then we switched to the application securities, critical security domains related to AppSex. Uh, we discussed about the pen tester and ethical hackers. What is the role of that pen testers and ethical hackers? We discussed about the DevSecOps uh, OS top 10. That was again uh, very informative about the uh, OS top 10 because this is very needful for the research area for the professors and uh, researchers. We discussed about the API securities OS top 10 and we switch to the cloud native. So ultimately, uh, Madam, from your end, the session was fully informative. And I would say that the session was kind of to fulfill the research area. We motivated from the cloud native securities. Uh, we motivated from uh, the OS top 10 that we discussed. And definitely we will start our research on this top 10 and the cloud native security. So we thank you so much. We are glad to have you on board uh, uh, and fully uh, two, two hours and 30 minutes we discussed. And that was the really impressive session and very informative sessions. We are thank you so much, ma'am, uh, to have you. And again, we'll uh, invite you for the next upcoming sessions for the girls only. Uh, and definitely uh, uh, we'll invite you with the different FDPs also. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I am honored and I hope I could share some information. And I know that I couldn't share everything in two and a half hours. If you have any questions, I've shared my LinkedIn profile. I've shared my Twitter profile. Please do feel free to drop me a note. I'll be very, very glad to speak to you and connect with you. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Uh, your response was very prompt, ma'am. And, and really, I appreciate your time and support on this FDP. This is AICTE Training and Learning FDP, Faculty Development Program. And from RK University, from our director, from our HOD and School of Engineering, uh, we are very thankful to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, Thank thanks. you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks.
so with this uh, we are going to uh, close the session uh, madam has given the linkedin and twitter profile if you want to ask any questions or any queries you can connect with her uh, again uh, i thank you all the participants and researchers and definitely from the today uh, sessions you learned a lot of things and uh, i i ensure you that this will definitely help you for the research so with this remarks uh, we are going to close the meeting thank you so much ma'am again yeah thanks let us see in the moderating bench Yeah, signing off from this meeting. Thank you.